Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Faith Lutheran Mission Church. My name is Nick Kessler, pastor here at the church. Good morning to everyone sitting in our pews. And good morning to everyone who's watching us online. So now, going to a time of worship, Kayla will bring us into the presence of the Lord with some music. And this can this time to open up your hearts and minds for what God has to say for you today. Thank you. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may lie in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake, forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of Lutheran Congregation Mission for Christ and by God's authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, that the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia.
Jesus truly is the way, the truth, and the life. Help us, Lord, to incorporate that truth in all that we do and say. And we pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit as one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> So we start the reading from Acts chapter 6. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called a meeting of all believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God not running a food program. And so the brothers selected seven <coughs> men who were well respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea. They chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted. Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. But one day, some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, as it is called, was called, started to, started to debate with him. They were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Cilicia, and the province of Asia. This was Stephen's reply. You stubborn people, 
You are heathens at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? <coughs> That's what your ancestor did, and so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah, whom you betrayed and murdered. You deliberately <coughs> disobeyed God's law, even though you received it from the hands of angels. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusations, and they shook their fists at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. They rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees, shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. <coughs> and with that, he died. Here ends the first lesson. The psalm is Psalm 146. The words will be on the screen, or you may look in your the green hymnal on page 287. We will read them responsibly. I will begin with the first verse. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers, nor in any child of earth, for there is no help in them. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the seas, and all that is in them, who keeps his promise forever who gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who hunger. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. He sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Hallelujah. The second lesson is found in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with the second verse. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you'll grow into the full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment, now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for a great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priest. Through the, med the meditation of Jesus Christ, the mediation, pardon me, of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word, and so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, 
Now you have received God's mercy. Here is the second lesson. Please rise as you are able for the gospel. Observe an elephant to understand what one really is. 
One walks to the elephant's side and proclaims, yeah, the elephant is like a wall. The, the second felt his tusk and confidently said that the elephant was like a spear. The third grabbed its trunk and said, this elephant is like a snake. The fourth, feeling the elephant's leg, said that the elephant was like a tree. And then the fifth blind man ran his hand across the elephant's ear and was sure that the elephant was like a fan. Finally, the sixth man took hold of the tail and announced that the elephant had to be like a rope. So John Godfrey Sex sums up the poem by saying this, and so these men of Indistan disputed loud and long, each one in his own opinion exceedingly stiff and strong. Though each party was in the right, all were in the wrong. We laugh at this poem, and yet how much different are the six blind men touching different parts of the elephant, just like people touching different parts of Christianity today and proclaiming what they think is the truth. Like the blind men, there are people who think they know what God is like, even though some may have it partly right, they are also wrong. They are like the, the blind people groping about. One sees this part of God and another sees something completely different. And each of their experiences are legitimate. However, they all fail to get at the reality of what God is like and who he really is. In the Christian faith, we, we don't rely on individual experience. Although these experiences can be very genuine and very real, instead, believers rely on what the Bible calls revelation. If we take a look at the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 17, Jesus asks the disciples who people were saying he was. The disciples said that some were saying he was Elijah. Some said he was John the Baptist. And some said that he was one of the Old Testament prophets come back to life. This is just like the blind men in the poem who are talking about the elephant. It's a wall. No, it's a snake. Uh, it's a tree. However, Jesus then asks the disciples who they said he was. And Peter gives not just an individual truth, but the real truth when he proclaims, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. In this part of verse 17, Jesus tells Peter how he knows the real truth. You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. <clears throat> this proclamation of truth was not something Peter could have figured out by himself. It was something that had to be revealed to him by God. Peter understood who Jesus was only because God had revealed that truth to him. And the same is true for each of us. Without God's revelation, we would each have a, a piece of the truth without knowing how it relates to the whole. Just like those blind men in the elephant. So today, we're not going to rely on various opinions from blind observers. Instead, we're going to take a look at some specific revelations that God has revealed about himself through his son, Jesus. Jesus proclaims this in verse 6 from our gospel text for today. I am the way, the truth. In the life, no one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus proclaims, I am the way. 
Well, the first thing we need to uh, realize and understand is that you and I are definitely not the Word. And there's two errors present today which cause people to believe in their thinking that they are the way. First error is because of a New Age philosophy. The New Age religion tries to convince people that since they are spiritual beings, they are in effect God. And this is very appealing to people because it means if, that, if they're their own God, then they get to make up their own rules. And because they would submit only to their own will and desires, then they don't have to submit to the rule of any other God. So what we have today are people who are trying to be spiritual without having any experience or relationship with any God other than themselves. They are attracted to all kinds of spiritual issues and make no differentiation between religions or gods, between good or evil, conflicting ideologies, or certainly moral distinctions. As long as it's got some kind of a spiritual element, it's all good. People may be into uh, Eastern mysticism, astrology, crystals, or even astral projection. And they feel in tune with their spiritual realm. What's interesting, though, is that most of these smorgasbord spiritual people do not even consider Jesus as an option. And this is because Jesus calls all of his followers to die to themselves. And any time, the truth involves a total commitment in which you bring yourself to complete humility and to the surrender of the will, you will always have resistance. Because at the heart of the rejection of Jesus as the Christ is a resistance to the claim of who he really is. And that's the ultimate truth of it all. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You and I can never be the way. Jesus is the only way we can come to God. We are not God, and we cannot become a God. Neither can we be our own Savior. Because if we can be good enough to save ourselves from our sins and get to heaven on our own, Jesus died on the cross for nothing. So it really comes down to this, folks. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. That means we either believe Jesus truly is the way, or we are. So there can't be any sitting on the fence on this one, folks. It's the first error, a New Age philosophy. The second error is that other religions can also seem to be a way to the truth of life. There, this is one of the major objections people have about the Christian faith. Many believe that Christianity is just one way of lots of ways to get to heaven. What this thinking does is to put all the religions on a gigantic spiritual smorgasbord and it just invites people to come and take a little of this and a little of that and they take whatever philosophical and theological parts they like and they call it good. However, what if the reality is that only one of the things on this smorgasbord is actually food? And the rest has no real nutritional value. <clears throat> Think of it this way. Imagine that through a cancer research program, there's a sudden breakthrough in the cure for cancer. A completely non-invasive, painless, one-time treatment that would reverse the spread and completely cure the cancer. Now, 
Let's stretch this concept just a bit further. Imagine that it's not just a partial cure for some people, but that it works every time for every person. Now let's imagine that everyone on the planet has cancer and is in need of a cure. Would it be close-minded, narrow, or arrogant for these cancer research scientists who developed this cure to say this is the only cure for cancer? Now, of course, others would still be free to try other forms to cure their cancer. Radiation treatments, herbs, acupuncture, and many other options. However, would it be wrong to try and convince these people that there was only one way? And would it be wrong to believe that there was only one true cure? Now, this is not to say that other religions of the world do not have some truth in their teachings. And it's also not to say that the other religions do not have some value or that they do not promote a moral code. The ultimate question of truth, though, is this. Are these religions the way to God? Are they the true cure for our sins and separation from God? The reality is that just having some truth about God is like holding the tail of an elephant and believing you know all about it. So when humans rely upon themselves to try and figure out God, it's like the blind men reaching for an elephant. And that's what separates <clears throat> the Christian faith from all other religions. Christianity is not about people reaching for God. It's about God reaching for us. It's about God revealing himself to us, giving us the scriptures, coming to us, and then giving himself for us. So let's put all of this together. Jesus proclaimed, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Plain and simple. What this means is, Jesus is the only way to God. And because of this truth, <coughs> we're then faced with the following conclusion. Either Jesus is who he said he really was, or he's a liar and a fraud. There is no in-between here. The Bible clearly states that Jesus is the Savior from our sin and the only way to get to heaven. And so if we reject that Jesus Christ is the only way to God, we are not only rejecting the words of Jesus himself, but we are also rejecting the witness of Scripture, the proclamation of the historic church, and the testimony of all those who have experienced this reality in their personal lives throughout the ages. Another interesting thing about other religions is that uh, none of their leaders claimed to be God. Certainly none of them have a God who comes to earth in human form in order to die a redemptive death and then rise from the dead. Yet, these are the claims of Jesus and his followers. The Bible summarize, summarizes and proclaims this truth. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. So each of us needs to ask ourselves this. <clears throat> when we seek for the way and the truth for our lives, will we seek for this truth within the politically correct doctrines of the day? <clears throat> or will we believe the words of Scripture that the way and truth for eternal life is through Jesus Christ? Let us pray.
Father God, we thank you that, that, that you've given us your holy word to proclaim the truth about who you are and how we can be with you. Lord, we also thank you that the only way to be with you is through your Son, Jesus. Help us, Lord, to proclaim that it is only through your Son, Jesus, that we can find the way, the truth, and the life of being with you. And it is in his holy name that we pray. Amen. Our next hymn is Holy, Holy, Holy. Still working out of the green hymnal. This is hymn number 165. The words will also be up on the screen. Stephen did, 
and be able to still proclaim the truth that is through you and through your son Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, you are a God of healing. You've done so much within this congregation and within friends and families as well. And Lord, we pray for your healing. For those of us who are in our hearts and minds that are in need of your healing touch, whether that's in body, mind, or spirit. Lord, come to those who are on our minds right now. <coughs> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our prayer. Lord, we pray for all those who may be in a time of mourning right now, people who have passed away, we pray, especially for David Cisneros and the family of Romaldo who passed away this morning, Lord. Uh, he fought the battle, Lord, so young, but he is with you now and he is healed. We pray for everyone within the family. Bring them strength, bring them peace. Lord, we pray for anyone else who's going through a mourning at this time. Maybe not even people who have just passed recently, but are still mourning people who have lost at this time of year. Father God, bring them strength and bring them peace that is only through you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we also pray for the healing of this nation. Lord, we, we've turned away from you, Lord, and the only way we're going to get back right is through you. Lord, we pray for your discernment, we pray for your guidance to all of our leaders of this nation, from our president down to city councils and school boards. Lord God, guide them, direct them. Protect them, Lord, from any kind of human or evil intervention that may sway the will you have for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we especially pray, Lord, for those people putting their lives on the line for this nation, all those soldiers who voluntarily have gone for it, far away from family and friends even, to fight for the freedoms we have here. Protect them, Lord. Keep them safe. And while they're on mission, Lord, surround your arms around them and keep them safe. When their mission is done, Lord, bring them back home. Reunite them with their families. And Lord, remind us then that we've got to stand by them as they stood by for us to help them transition back into society. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. Lord, we Pray for all those people putting their lives on the line in our own community. Law enforcement, ambulance, fire department personnel, even emergency room personnel and hospitals. Protect them, Lord, on shift. Remind us, Lord, every time we hear a siren, or even though we see a squad car, an ambulance, or a fire truck, Lord, we need to pray for those officers. We need to pray for any situation that they're responding to, Lord, and also pray for a healing as well. Protect them, Lord. Keep them safe. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And we pray, Lord, for those people who are proclaiming your gospel truth throughout the world. Lord, protect them. Keep them safe. Protect them from any kind of human evil and evil of Satan. Lord, protect all of their ministries from any kind of human evil and evil of Satan. Lord, we pray also that you can provide them with the resources they need to do those ministries you have called them to. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Father God, we continue to pray for peace to descend upon those nations that are in turmoil. There's a lot of them, Lord. We pray especially, Lord, for Israel, Ukraine, Syria, Ethiopia. Lord, bring your peace. Bring your strength. Bring us guidance and discernment how you want us best as a nation to respond to the resources that are needed for those countries. Help us, Lord. Bring us discernment, bring us guidance, and bring your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. If there's anyone who has any prayers that they would like to make at this time, please go ahead and say that. Father, we pray for the community in Texas who is waking up today to lives who are lost. Yes, Lord. We ask that you will just be with them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. <clears throat> Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in the mercy of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. Yes. And also with you. Please share that peace of God with one another. 
We will all take our offering at this time. I thank you in advance for your grateful and gracious hearts. Anyone who would like to write for our ministries here at Faith Lutheran Mission Church who's watching us online, address is at the bottom of the screen. If you can write out a check, <laughs> we promise to use it for building the kingdom of God. Also, PayPal is available.
God of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace. Amen. Please rise as you are able for the benediction. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord shine His face upon you and give you His everlasting strength, peace, and protection. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Kids, you can head on down for Sunday school. The rest of us children of God, we've got one more hymn to sing. And that is, I think you guys know this one, How Great Thou Art? Okay, good, good, good. Still not working out of the green hymnal yet. This is hymn number 532. Words will also be up on the screen. <laughs>
the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.